Welcome, my friends, to this holy time set apart to have our hearts focused on God. As we come together for this time of worship, I invite you to center yourselves this day with the call to worship. Long ago, there was a discussion in the early church about what you needed to do in order to be part of the body of Christ. Today, we remember the wisdom of Paul. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. Amen and amen. Would you join me in prayer? Most precious Lord, as we come today and hear about arguments in the church that happened so long ago, we confess that we know that there are still arguments today. And so, Lord Jesus, lead us through your word. Speak to us your truth. And then send us out, not just as folks to proclaim it with our lips, but who live it out with our lives. Lord Jesus, we give this time to you. We give our hearts to you and ask that you be glorified. Amen. Friends, today we're going to join each other in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, which is often called the Council of Jerusalem, which is a really nice way to put it. <laughs> What's really happening is that factions of the church are arguing with one another and the leaders need to come together and figure out how they're going to live together, how they're going to spread the good news together. And I think we all know that that is easier said than done. And so if you have things bubbling up for you this day, times that you have had an argument with a brother and sister in Christ and it hasn't ended well, times that you have insisted on your way instead of following the leading of the spirit, well, my friends, I invite you to bring it before the Lord in an attitude of confession. You pray saying, Lord, we confess that we, like the early church, have spent much time arguing about who is in and who is out. Give our hearts of grace that believe and live into the truth that you and you alone we are saved through. Let us not put yokes upon ourselves and others that we cannot fulfill but let our lives be for you alone. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to hear the good news, which is this. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Praise be to God. Amen. Friends, what I love about the Apostles' Creed is it lays out the essentials of the faith, the things that unite us as believers. And so, my friends, let us come together and proclaim them again today as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, as we continue on in a spirit of prayer, I invite us to go back to some of the ancient prayers of faith, specifically today from Psalm 22, starting in verse 25. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. 
My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Amen and amen. Friends, our song of reflection for this day is a verse from Standing on the Promises. And we know that there are lots of promises found in God's word. But the promise that means the most to me, my friends, is that God will never leave us or forsake us, that God is always right there with us, no matter what we may be going through. I don't know what promise means the most to you, but may you bring it before the Lord as an offering as we sing together and proclaim these words of faith. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Our scripture for the day continues on in the story of the early church found in the book of Acts, and today we'll be joining each other in the 15th chapter. But before we get into that, I invite all of us to consider ourselves to be children of God, no matter what age we may be, to come together and talk about a question. And my question is this, have you ever had a disagreement with someone? Well, in order to know if we've had a disagreement with someone, we have to know what a disagreement is. And a disagreement is usually when we have multiple people who are coming from different sides on an issue. Maybe when you were growing up or if you're on the playground now, your disagreement is we want to play a game together. Do we play baseball or kickball? But not all disagreements are about things that are play or things that we enjoy. Sometimes disagreements are about what we believe. And that's where people were in the early church. They were disagreeing about what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Or rather, what do you need to do if you believe in Jesus? And they were having this disagreement around something really specific, but I think that the larger issue is how do we disagree well? Because the truth is we aren't always going to agree, but how do we disagree in a way that still honors God and honors those that we disagree with as children of God? 
Well, one of the ways is to pray, right? To pray, God, give me your eyes to see. Give me your heart to respond. And that's a really big prayer to pray. But also sometimes it means stopping and thinking about what are we really arguing about? Is it really as important as I think it is? And if it is, fantastic. Then how do I argue in a way that still honors God? And if it's not something as big as what we're making it, then maybe we step back and say, okay, we'll do something different. Friends, disagreeing is part of life because we're not all the same. And yet we are all called to disagree well, to disagree in a way that brings God glory. So next time you're on the playground and you're having a fight about something, or maybe you're in the workplace and you have a disagreement, I invite you to stop, to pray and to ask that God give you a heart to respond. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we wish we lived in a world where everyone agreed all the time, and yet we know that's not the way it is. And so, Lord, we ask that you be with us. We ask that you lead us, and we ask above all that when we find ourselves in those disagreements, that we can still live in a godly way. Lord Jesus, may you be the one who is glorified in and through us. Amen. As we turn to the scripture before us in the book of Acts in the 15th chapter, my friends, we will join each other right in verse one if you'd like to follow along. And I'd invite us all to open up our hearts to receive this word this day. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Pharisaenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, my brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you. And I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did for us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he's made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listening to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other people may seek the Lord, even the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord who has been making these things known from long ago. 
Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most awesome God, we may no longer be arguing about the same things, but we know that there are still disagreements within your body. So speak to us your holy truth this day. Reign in our hearts, Lord, and help us to live as those who put you first in all things. In your most precious name we pray. Amen. If I asked you, what are the most important things for Christians to believe? I bet some things would come to your mind right away. And if I then would ask you how Christians should or shouldn't act, I bet you'd have a list for all of that as well. But I have a secret to tell you. I bet then if we would sit down and compare those two lists with everyone else joining in worship today, there may be some differences. There's no way that they would be 100% identical all the time. There's a saying that most preachers have five sermons that they preach over and over and over again. And friends, I have to warn you that this topic, this is one of those sermons that I hold in my heart and I proclaim again and again, that I am passionate that believers sometimes don't agree. In fact, they don't always agree about absolutely everything in the faith. We only need to look around and see different denominations that have fractured or split off to know that that is true. But case in point, we only have to go as far back as today's scripture in the early church. Often people will herald the book of Acts as being the epitome of what the church today should be. They'll look at all the thousands of people being saved and new churches being planted, and they'll proclaim, we should go back like that. We should go back to the book of Acts. But in making that proclamation, I often think that we are ignoring all of the hard parts the sticky parts of the book of Acts. We talked just a few weeks ago about one of those hard parts that believers from different regions were arguing over whose widows were being treated better when it came to the food distribution. Now today, we aren't arguing about food distribution. We aren't arguing about the widows. It is the leaders of the church who are having a pretty significant disagreement about circumcision. See, Paul had previously been sent out by God with the blessing of the church in Jerusalem to take the good news to the Gentiles. It was this call upon Paul's life that he received on that road to Damascus when he was struck blind and heard the voice of Jesus speaking over him. Now, at that time, the church in Jerusalem was seen as the central hub for believers, and James was one of its most influential leaders, even if we hear about Peter a bit more. So Paul was commissioned by this church in Jerusalem to go forth and spread the good news to the Gentiles, and then to go and form communities of faith so they can continue to grow into that good news and go forth and spread it as well, teaching and preaching about the salvation found in Jesus. And friends, it had such a wide success. And he didn't actually even limit the sharing of the gospel to Gentiles, going to synagogues to preach about Jesus as well. And so by this point, Paul has seen several new faith communities come into formation, chiefly composed of Gentiles or non-Jewish people. Now, Paul is back in Jerusalem and has hit a bit of a snag. 
a pretty significant disagreement. People are going to the folks that Paul had taught about the faith, these Gentiles, these new church plants, and saying they weren't really believers. They weren't really followers of Jesus unless they had been circumcised. A few months back during a Bible study for our parish in the book of Genesis, I had this new revelation that came to me around circumcision. Now, I think we all have heard circumcision about Abram hearing this call from God that he is to confirm the promise that God is passing on to him with this outward sign, this circumcision of skin. And yet, it wasn't that that struck me this particular day as we were looking at circumcision in the book of Genesis. It was this. What an act of trust. Sure, Abraham had to trust God in order to perform this to his own body, but think about how everyone else must have had to trust Abraham and Abraham's faith in God deeply as well. For all those male servants who were circumcised by Abraham's hand, how Ishmael had to trust his dad because by no means is he a little boy at this point. And Sarah, can you imagine the conversation that Abraham must have had with Sarah after he had this profound experience with God? He said, so God told me that I'm to cut off the foreskin of every male, and then that's going to be a sign of God's promise. Yet all those hard conversations, all that trust came to fruition in people being willing to follow Abraham, willing to follow his lead because they knew him, they knew his faith in God, and they trusted him. Now, here are these folks essentially going and stirring up discontent amongst the believers. It's such a sign that that same trust is absent. Folks who are new believers who they don't have a relationship with because it is ultimately trying to damage their relationship with Paul. So now Paul gets into the sharp disagreement along with Barnabas with these folks who are teaching new things and confusing these new followers and trying to stir up discontent. They packed their bags and they headed back to Jerusalem to have it out with the church there, this central hub of the teaching of faith. In some ways, it would be so easy to make this disagreement too simple. See, on one hand, you have these folks who are all about tradition, and then on this other hand, you have Paul, who's trying to do new things and teach a new type of, of belief, and the traditionalists are saying you need to be circumcised, but Paul, Paul is saying, no, you don't have to do that anymore. If you aren't Jewish, you don't have to do that to follow Jesus. And yet, friends, it's never that simple. We miss the richness of what is undergirding all of this, undergirding the understanding of people taking the good news far and wide to new groups of people who are not Jewish. We miss the rich truth of what it means to raise up disciples of Jesus Christ. We miss the calling on Paul and Barnabas's life. Because here's the thing. If we have too simplistic an understanding, we miss the fact that the church already had this disagreement. Back in Acts chapter 11, when one of their own Peter had this vision from God about what was clean versus unclean, and it led him to the house of a Gentile where he not only went in, but he baptized a whole household. And so when Peter was called before the church to give an account, the people gathered ended up saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So that simplistic understanding what we think it's about, traditionalist versus something new that they're arguing about, that's not it. It's really about 
what does it mean to follow the law? It's really about something much bigger underneath the surface, the thing beyond the thing. You know what I'm talking about, right? Have you ever found yourself in an argument with someone about one thing only to find that the argument is actually about something completely different? Sometimes we can name that thing, other times we can't, but we have to get to the heart of what we're truly disagreeing about in order to find a resolution. And that thing, that thing underneath the thing, underneath the thing that Paul is bringing before the council and saying, look at it, name it, is this, who belongs? Who gets to be part of this Jesus movement that has exploded with these first disciples? Who is welcome in the family of God? And friends, we're still here 2,000 years later having a different version of the same argument. Who belongs to the family of God? Who are the people that we are called to break bread with? And not just any bread, but the bread of holy communion. Who are the people who bear the same name as us, Christians, even if we don't agree about everything? The folks at the discussion that day were able to break it down to the most important things. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us. That is the most essential thing. There's this quote that's often misattributed to John Wesley, but I think it's still wise no matter who said it. And it's this. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In other words, what's the most important thing? What's the essential thing? The grace of Jesus Christ, the life-saving, life-changing grace of Jesus Christ. And what do we do with the rest? Well, the early church said we don't need to put a burden on some of these things onto the Gentile believers. They don't have to become Jewish. They don't have to become like us. They don't have to do that in order to be a follower of Jesus. So for them, circumcision wasn't one of the most important things. But here's what a list of what is, a really short list. Friends, we don't need to go back to the book of Acts in order to be the church. But we can learn what it means to be the church, even if we disagree from the book of Acts. What might God be speaking to us today in and through this disagreement? Amen. As we continue on in our worship of God, we present our hearts in the form of prayer. Lord, I know that many of those who are gathered are here are bringing burdens into this service, and we all know that we can share that. We can share that burden with one another. And so if you're joining us online and you'd like to share your prayer requests and you're on a live, you can just jump right down to the chat and share it there. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's absolutely fine as well. Know that you can reach out to any of the members of this church, especially myself, and we will lift up you in prayer. Let's turn to God. Well, we do know that we come with hearts that are crying out, hearts that are burdened for so many things this day. Lord, I know for myself, I bring before you in prayer the, the burden of our brothers and sisters in India. I know for others, they are grieving deep losses that are walking through times of trial as family. They are worried about those that they care for. And Lord, still others are worried about people in our community, about things that we may not all know or may not all see. And Lord, we lift those up as well. Lord, I thank you that no matter what burden is on our hearts, we can share it with one another. And then we can ultimately bring it before you in prayer. Lord, I thank you that you not only hear us, but that you then respond. Maybe not always in the ways that we expect, but always for your glory and always for your kingdom. 
So Lord Jesus, we pray today that you open up our hearts to receive what you may be doing in and through us and for us, Lord. As we pray that prayer you taught long ago, saying, our Father that art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we turn now to a time of prayer. I'd invite you not to just present your tithes and offerings to God, but also present your heart, especially when our heart gets a little battered during those disagreements. May we present our response to God and ask that it gives him all the glory. Let us join each other praying over all that we offer this day saying, oh God of abundance, we come before you now to return just a portion of all that you have blessed us with. We do so not out of obligation, but as an act of worship. Take what we have given in love and use it to share your mercy and grace with the world, we pray. Amen. Just a few announcements I'd like to highlight before we leave each other's company and go forth to live out our faith in the world. Mostly, I want to lift up Ohio's council meeting, which is going to be on Monday at 7.30 p.m. And if you have any questions about that, you're free to reach out to me or to any of the others that serve on the council. And now, friends, I send us out with these words. The whole assembly kept silence. And listening to Barnabas and Paul as they told of the signs and wonders that God had done through them to the, among the Gentiles. And as they finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen. Friends, let us not just listen to one another, but let us listen ultimately to the spirit of God as we go forth to live out our faith. Amen and amen.